There's my mouse. There we go. There's a mouse. Okay, so I'm going to be presenting. Since this is a large enough, or this is a, a small enough group at this point, I think I'm going to present over here. So just so that I don't have to go off and deal with two sides of the room. So if you're over on this side, if you just come over to this side, that'll be easier. And uh, make it a little bit more straightforward for our folks. And I will go off and just quickly... Um, so just briefly, how many people know what Drupal is? How many people know what WordPress is? How many people think they know the difference between WordPress and Drupal? Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I'm, a, I'm a rather, uh, I'm a little bit biased in terms of, of uh, my views on, on uh, open source and Drupal and, and WordPress because I'm a uh, Drupal core uh, accessibility maintainer. So I've been working on trying to go off and, and improve Drupal core's accessibility now for the last seven years, I think. Um, and it's been a long struggle. It's been something that, that's been a, a really interesting process to sort of be involved with, with the uh, a community of people to try and, and change the, uh, the structure of, of the software, but it's been really quite, quite useful. Um, I've also got a company, Open Concept Consultant, here in town. We, we exclusively do Drupal. So if you want to come, if you want some help on WordPress, uh, we can't help you. Um, likewise on Team Site or anything else. Um, and I wanted to uh, to talk a little bit first about what is what we've done with Drupal Seven. And now this is this is quite a while ago because Drupal Seven was released three years ago, and we're now you know uh, almost finished Drupal Eight, but um, software development is a really interesting process, and it's a, it's a, how many people have been involved in, in creating a software project or a, a product that, that, is, that is released? Has anyone been involved? So a couple people being involved in, in managing software projects. It's a neat process, but it's something that is, um, it's, it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience to be involved in, particularly in an open source project. Um, but Drupal 7 is now out in the wild and has been for three years. There's, there's over a million websites that are using Drupal 7 at this point. Uh, not as many as WordPress, but 100% um, of them have the accessibility features that we've built into core in them. So you know, you've got 22,000 WordPress plugins for, for that versus a million uh, for, for Drupal. So in terms of sort of basic accessibility elements, there's, there's stuff that we've built into Drupal that is, is just is being there and it's being tested by all sorts of people. So it's being used by, uh, by Berkeley, by, by Stanford, by the White House, by, um, it's being used right now by the Weather Channel. So there's all sorts of people who are using it. If you look at the list of, of, of organizations that are using any content management system, Drupal is the, the um, in terms of, of, of organizations for disabled people, um, the biggest, the most commonly used uh, content management system is Drupal. So whether it's AbilityNet or the National Federation of the Blind or uh, even the CNIB is using it, uh, as are a bunch of other uh, large organizations that are, are working for, for the blind, for disabled, for dyslexic, for, for a range of different people who are, um, even the, the uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, of nonprofits that are, are using it and are, are, are finding ways to improve it, and, and, and just like with WordPress, it's open source, so people are improving it and finding ways to make it better, uh, and, meet, and tar target it for their particular audience. Um, it's been really quite dominant in the education and government sectors, um, partly because it's, it, it's, it's a more complex framework, so it's allowed to scale up and, and to manage things that are, are bigger, and, and you know, um, it's interesting, Carlton here has gone for WordPress, or one of the universities that's gone for, for WordPress. There's a lot of other universities that have gone for, for Drupal because it is, it's more institutionally structured and scaled for, 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 for uh, structured content uh, and for users and for, for, for structured permission. And it's been, 
is being further ahead of that game uh, for longer. Now, WordPress is doing a lot for, for trying to go off and catch up, and there's a real nice competitive you know, uh, element between the two, so that's excellent. There's nothing quite like healthy competition to try and, and, uh, and get us all to, to be better and to be, to be pushing ourselves further. Um, but we've, we've identified and resolved a lot of accessibility bugs. And one of the, the great things about going off and, and, I, and having an open forum to go off and look at and address accessibility issues is that you, you can pick off the easy free. Like if, if you're still dealing with a content management system that doesn't deal with alt text, alt text effectively, it's very difficult to go off and then get into some of the deeper, more complex issues because you get stumped in all, the, all of the things that are relatively easy to fix. Um, but in Drupal 7, we've, we've eliminated most of the, the basic problems, like even on, on a level of forms. Um, most of our forms are, are accessible out of the box. In Drupal 7, you have a lot of stuff that's, that's already there out of the box for accessibility. So um, you have um, all of, all of the, the, uh, the, the uh, input forms have, have labels associated with them. So you're not having to deal with, um, with, with, uh, with, you know, uh, um, with problems with, with uh, basic, basic form accessibility, both on the administration side as well as on the public facing side. So we've gone off and looked at this at a very comprehensive level, not just sort of isolating what's happening on the, the public facing side versus on the administration side. Um, partly because you know, the, a lot of these tools are tools that can be used and reused by so many other people in, in different ways. So you know, what might be an administrative function for some, some site may be um, a, a basic um, you know, a user function in another. So we haven't wanted to go off into to segregate how people are using and managing the, the, uh, the content of the website. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, documentation. There's also quite a lot of buy-in from the community. So um, all the way from uh, Dreams, from the other core developers, from uh, various different uh, high-level members of the Drupal community, a lot of Drupal shops talking about accessibility um, and really trying to contribute back and trying to, to make these tools better. Um, so this, is, this has been going on now for, um, for in Drupal 7 for, I guess it's three years, uh, and it's, it's also been continuing on in, in, in Drupal 8 as well. We're trying to go up and to push this better. Because uh, one of the, the crazy things about accessibility is that it's, it's really complicated. And the further you get into it, the more there is to learn, the more there is to do, the more there is to, it's, it's, it's not an easy checkbox. It's a, it's a very complex issue that has a lot of different layers associated with it. So Drupal 7 sort of skimmed off a lot of the easy areas. And with Drupal 8, we're trying try to continue that and push ourselves further to, to get better at uh, addressing other elements of WK and, and other, area, other barriers to participation. And we're trying to set that up by default so that, that when people come to using um, this content management system, that they're able to go off and to simply um, load it up and have those best practices up and running without having to add in any additional plugins or any additional pieces. That the, the core has a lot of accessibility best practices baked into it. So um, it's a, it's a, it is a definitely a big process to try and bring um, code into the core of a project. And, and it's a, um, there's, there's a, a whole lot of, of development and discussion that happens as part of, um, of trying to go off and, and, and to, to make a release. And, and uh, so if anyone's looked at, has anyone got an account on Drupal.org? Okay. And if you look at the issue queues on, on Drupal.org for various different problems that come up, there's, there's a lot of discussion and debate. It's a very democratic community structure, um, which, is, which is good and bad. Um, democracy takes a lot of work. It's a, a long, painful process a lot of the times. Um, but it allows us to have that extensive review process. There's, there's a lot of work that's gone into trying to have a, uh, a very structured, automated system for testing and evaluating code. We don't quite have the method to, to going off and building those automated tools um, for accessibility into the automated tools for checking Drupal and Drupal code, but we're getting there. There's been a lot of work done to try and, and build tools to check accessibility of code that's contributed to Drupal for accessibility, to do that in an automated system so it doesn't have to always be waiting on the, uh, the experience of an accessibility team to be able to, to, to vet uh, problems and, and to, to realize there are problems. Um, so trying to go up and, and you know, really incorporate as much as we can automated tools and, and the accessibility team into the whole process of, uh, of producing this, this project before it is released and, and, and testing the information before it's released. Um, there's, it's uh, between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, um, there's, there's uh, quite a lot of discussion um, that you may or may not be aware of about you know, 
Drupal 8, there's quite a lot of controversy around Drupal 8. Um, there's there's a, a really interesting uh, project that's forked off uh, from Drupal 7 to try and, because of, of tensions that were happening in Drupal 8 and some of the things that Drupal 8 was tr trying to accomplish called Backdrop. Um, and uh, uh, Nate is one of the, the Lobobot team who's, who's pushing uh, Backdrop and it's a really interesting project and I think that there's, uh, I think it's quite healthy for the community to go off and have that that fork and to have that sort of discussion about what kind of a platform and what kind of a system is it, is it that we want to have. But um, but there's changes that happen between every major release. Like whenever software comes out, it's not it's not like that, that from version uh, like on any software. If you're talking about jQuery or uh, or CK Editor, whenever you do a major release of, of software, there are often there's functionality that's approached in a completely new way, and often um, things that have been added for accessibility or usability are forgotten about and dropped as part of that process. So. You know, it, you know, there's always an effort every every time there's a major release to, to evaluate and reevaluate the software to make sure that it's it's something that is able to we haven't lost any functionality that we're able to really take advantage of what's there and what's being brought into um, into the software of, of the, uh, um, with the, the latest release. Um, so it's a um, one of the, the neatest things about about Drupal is that, that a lot of these in, in, in Drupal.org all of the the discussions are open, and you don't need to have a. In order to look at them, you don't need to have a um, a user account, and, and that's not the case for for every every CMS. Some of that CMSs we are, are definitely more gated in terms of, of who has access to the discussions. But there's been some really interesting discussions about accessibility best practices that have happened in the Drupal issue queue. Um, even things as simple as how to deal with CSS display none, which is a you know it's, it's one little line of, of CSS, but it's a you know, I'm quite confident that somebody at some point will write a master's you know, or a PhD dissertation on how to deal with this and what has what different communities have done to try and deal with this. Because just even in Drupal, there have been you know hundreds and hundreds of comments on how to deal with something as simple as CSS display none. And even still, it hasn't got we haven't got to a point that is completely universal. Like even after we released Drupal seven, um, there were changes to uh, to, to the browser, so the Firefox changed, and, and questions. Uh, Jonathan Snook was, was uh, posted a critique of it because it didn't support the BlackBerry particularly well, and, and so he suggested some revisions around this. But a lot of that element of trying to go up and say, well, this is a common web problem, and we can address this common web problem by trying to um, centralize the, the, um, how we address it in one common place so that we can at least begin to evaluate and update and, and improve it we can, we can sort of maintain that, and, that, and that's, uh, that's something that, that we've, um, we've done with Drupal 7 and it's been quite successful. We've had quite a lot of buy-in from uh, modules that, that are, are developed in Drupal 7, and there's some 20,000 modules that are, are built with Drupal 7, so it's a, uh, quite a, uh, a, a lot of code base that, that needs to be maintained and brought up, but, but there's, there's certainly a lot of adoption on, on some of these, these, uh, these ideas. Um, so, So with Drupal 8, we wanted to try and, and, and do a bunch of things differently. So um, we wanted it mobile friendly out of the box, the entire thing. So the administration side as well as the public, the, uh, the public facing side. Um, so you can you know be at the, at the beach and, and, uh, and you know administering your website through your cell phone as opposed to having to be at a desktop device. Um, we wanted to go off and, and try and leverage as many other tools from other places as we could so that we're not recreating the wheel. This is a real big problem in open source where we tend to reinvent and reinvent um, constantly these, these, uh, um, these software tools where, where it's not really needed and it's not really a good idea. So we've, um, we now have a, uh, a WYSIWYG editor in core and that's one that's based on, on uh, a CK editor. So we just sort of brought in a CK editor and have that, that tool built in. Um, we also want to go off and, and uh, set good examples in core so that you know, a lot of times, you know, Good developers are lazy developers, so the people who will go off and, and they'll take what's there and they'll copy an example and use that example because it's faster and quicker and probably better than just writing it out from scratch. So if you can have good examples in core that are well documented and well supported and that people are going to follow, it's going to be, you're going to find that propagated in the community so much, so much more effectively. Um, we also added a lot of, of, uh, of code for, for uh, support for, for areas. So, um, there's been some discussion here, and some of the others, uh, 
it's quite interesting to go up and see how an area is adopted. Um, how many people are developing websites for the area right now? Um, there's, it's, it's not that many people who are using it yet. Um, in the books, you know, it's not true. It's, it is getting built and being, being brought out, but it's, it's something that, that takes some changes in, in behavior, both of the users and the developers and of the browsers. So uh, and it's, there's still some things that are, we're still going to need to go off and to, and to leverage some of the old school ways of, of, of laying out uh, landmarks within web pages. So you can't just sort of swap out um, you know, heading tags for area and say, okay, well, we've got this sorted because we, we now can, we can leverage uh, the, the landmark roles instead of using headings to go up into sort of segment the, the, the pages. Um, so there's, um, there's definitely um, you know, work to go up and improve that and to, to build in uh, more complex area functions. And, and like so many web-based tools these days, um, it's becoming so much more like the desktop. And the, the, the interactions that are expected that come out of by default are, are complicated. And so making sure you have that, set, that, that functionality codified and done in a way that is, is um, is clear and effective is, 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 a, is a, an important challenge. Um, we've also involved people with disabilities, which is quite useful to, to have, uh, have people who, have, uh, who are using, using screen readers and, and using other tools and are identifying things that uh, many of the developers who don't have disabilities have missed. Um, and that's, it takes a lot of time to go off and do that, but uh, uh, we've had, had developers um, who, who contribute to Drupal, there's yeah, developers who contribute more to Drupal 8 um, Drupal 8's accessibility, like uh, sorry, Vincenzo Rabano is, is a high school student in Italy, who, or when he was a high school student, he contributed more to, to Drupal 8, uh, Drupal 8's accessibility than, than any institution has ever contributed to core accessibility. So you know, an individual can make a huge difference. Uh, and a lot of times these larger institutions just don't have the framework to go off and contribute back. So like uh, so many universities in California are using Drupal. Um, but they're not allowed to contribute code back to the community to fix these problems uh, with accessibility that they're having to go off and address on their individual websites. And they're not able to do that for, for legal, legal reasons. The, uh, the legal department doesn't want them to go off and, and share anything back. And so there's this whole culture of, of not sharing code back to the community, which is really quite dysfunctional. Um, so we've also, you know, again, trying to go off and <coughs> lay out some best practices that we've, we've done in Drupal and Instagram provide these, these implementations. Um, we're underlying lending the content, or links and content right now. So that's, that's something that, that it's, it is a best practice. A lot of uh, accessibility and usability people said this is a clear, you know, still is the, is the number one clear best way to go up and indicate that something is a link. And it's a problem that, that's fairly pervasive in the, in the web industry. You know, a lot of designers haven't liked the underlying. Um, but we've done it in a way that I think is, is fairly useful and, and interesting. Um, We've done a number of color contrast improvements, particularly with, with uh, gradients. It's, it's difficult with gradients with some of the old color contrast tools to go up and identify where the problems are. Um, but we've identified and fixed a few more of those. We've also you know, found issues where, where there have been, um, where, where focused and hover haven't been linked. And again, this is a common problem that, that so much of the focus for accessibility is put towards the um, screen reader users who don't really care about hover and focus behavior. But for, uh, for people who are using keyboard only, it's, it's really critical to have that, uh, that overlap between uh, you know, the functionalities. If you're, you're tabbing through a web page, that, that you're going to have perhaps an improved functionality as you, as you hit on a link versus a, you know, you know, so many times you just get nothing. Once you, once you, if you're tabbing through a web page, you have no idea where you are and where the focus is in the link. Um, but, but having that, that best practice built in. Um, and we're also able to leverage. Um, some of the work that Nick did for CSS Lint. Is it, is it any use CSS Lint? We've, we've basically tried to hard code rules for, for CSS to make sure that um, we have uh, good best practices in place. So when there's new CSS that's being brought in uh, to Drupal 8, there's a, a CSS checker that sort of checks for some basic things like hover and link functionality and just make sure that those are set up properly. Um, does anyone know what orphan labels are? So orphan labels are HTML um, has traditionally been used for a lot of things, but labels are semantically supposed to be tied specifically to an input form. And if you have a label that is there only for visual reasons, it is an accessibility problem for a lot of people because the, a lot of, of assistive technology is looking for that associated uh, input form and it's not there. It's an open <laughs> label. Um, and 
And so we've done a lot to try and rip out the, uh, the labels and make sure that there, uh, that there is a, uh, that all of the content is, is, is structured so that, that if there's a label or an input form that they're, they're, yeah, they're paired up and not, there aren't any orphans running around. Um, I added a couple of these logos. These didn't exist, but I wanted to go off and have something that looked consistent. Um, for uh, HTML5, CSS3, area, uh, WCAG2, and also ATAG, uh, they are shielded. You can't see that on the slide. <laughs> but, um, you know, trying to go off and, and bring uh, Drupal up to HTML5 was also been an interesting challenge, uh, particularly since a lot of the browsers are still trying to adopt it. Uh, we've done things that, that are um, it's interesting to sort of work with a large content management system because there's things that are um, that are still evolving. Like you know, we, we've uh, incorporated uh, detail and summary elements in uh, in Drupal uh, Drupal 8 at this point, and those aren't well supported in browsers at this point. They're coming. They're going to be. You know, they're reasonably enough supported, but they're not natively supported well enough in, in many many browsers. Um, but it's it's something that we can do to help push the web ahead and push adoption of these these good platforms so that we don't have to go up and, and leverage field sets for everything. So if you have an expand collapse functionality, um, we're not having to sort of deal with, with um, semantically incorrect field sets for these sorts of things. We can, have, we can use details uh, and embed uh, field sets within those details so that, that you can collapse, and collapse that without having to worry about uh, messing up assistive technology. Um, we try to make it easy as, as possible as well for people to hide elements. So, we don't want to. Um, so there's a there's now a visually hidden field label formatter. So um, in core right now, you can go off and hide elements. You can hide labels so that they're not being presented to the user, but they will be available to the screen reader, and, and have that as part of core as a default element or default descriptive element which is part of core. And that you know again, it's, it's part of core, so then it gets um, it, it's it's easy to go off and adopt that for all of the other modules and the themes and the, and the custom code that's being generated because it's just part of core. Um, we had a really interesting issue on, on alt text because, you know, who thinks that, that alt text should be on every image? Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's, it is a really tricky issue because alt text is definitely something that is commonly not available. But there are some places where alt text is inappropriate. And um, so we wanted to go off and set up a situation whereby alt text was available, but that alt text wasn't, um, could be disabled. But we wanted to sort of deal with the user pattern. We're trying to think about a tag and, and, and the authoring guidelines and make it so that when somebody's creating a, uh, a page that it's just, it's just, they just get that nasty reminder on, on some things to just add that alt text and take that extra moment to, to um, to add the alt text, because you know, so many times that's the biggest problem you see on web pages is that they just haven't bothered to add the alt text to for what the image is. And if we can just add something to make it a little bit easier for people when they're adding images in places where there's clearly a need for them, just to remind them to make it that you know make it easier as opposed to doing an extra step, um, that we make it something that by default it is it's structured so it's going to ask you for alt text if you miss that, um, and have that as part of the, part of core. Um, we've also added a lot of, of help text inside the documentation for Drupal 8. Um, a tag is, is, a, is a specification that isn't finalized yet. There's a lot of hope for it. It's really quite an interesting um, specification from the WC3. But it's, it's, uh, it's something that is, um, they're, they're, yeah, the, so trying to, one of the, the guidelines is trying to make sure that there's documentation in the, the editor so that it explains to, to you what's happened, what the next steps are, and you know where, um, you know, because a lot of times somebody, if you're, if you're not an expert, you're just editing content, you're not going to know what the, the next element is. You're not going to know um, what are the, the um, um, so if you put in the help text that describes what the accessibility function is, then everyone will have easier access to it. They'll know how it should work and know why it's being added as an accessibility feature and how to go off and leverage this. JavaScript is great. There was a point under WK 1.0 where, where uh, it was told, we were told that, that uh, um, all, all the functionality had to work without JavaScript and that JavaScript needed to be disabled, but that no longer applies anymore since all of the assistive technology that's active these days works on the DOM, the document object model. So this is, uh, you know, working with, with JavaScript is really quite important. And we, we bundled in a couple things in here in Drupal 8 that are, are going to be really useful for, for developers moving ahead. Um, 
one of them is that there's a, a tabbing manager. Um, the, it's, it's important to be able to, um, as you're key, going using a keyboard to navigate through a web page, to be able to, um, to go in a logical order, to make sure that as you're tabbing through the web page, that, it's, you're, you, that, that it goes where you expect it to go. That the focus shouldn't jump all over the page. It should go from left to right, from top to bottom, and should flow in the normal order um, of your web page. And of course, if you're dealing with an Arabic page, it should go the other way. It should go from right to left. And that the, there's a structure to go from manage that, that normal, normal tabbing tab interface. Um, so we've, we've built in uh, a tool to, to allow us to, to, to have that uh, consistent uh, tabbing uh, implementation and, and be able to control how you tab through, uh, through the interface, through our more complicated devices. We've also added um, a tool to go off and use areas and announce functionality. So um, there's, uh, we've got the tool of uh, JavaScript we've added called the area announce, which leverages the, the, um, um, the area functionality for, for, for the tool to go up and make a, a, pl a polite interruption or a urgent interruption. Um, and so there's, there's three states as, as far as how urgent it is to go up and interrupt the, the screen reader to post to the screen reader about what, what it is that uh, is happening at that particular time. Um, but again, once that's centralized, it's easier for all of the other modules to go off and use it, because they don't have to redevelop the wheel. They can go off and look at what's happening in the core. They can say, OK, we just have to use this functionality that's already loaded anyways, and that's already being supported by a bunch of users. And we know that the pattern is going to be consistent for the users, because it's something that is, is there's not going to be any other way to go off and announce information to, to, user, to, to blind users. So there's a consistency that, that people are going to be using as they move forward with their implementations. Um, we also worked with the jQuery UI community to try and improve their accessibility and to, to try and do some testing and evaluation with that, um, which was, uh, again, a, a, neat, a neat part of that. We had done some work with uh, in Drupal 7 with autocomplete that worked very, very well um, for screen readers, and we wanted to make sure that that was something that was ro rolled ahead. Uh, but we also didn't want to go off and maintain this code ourselves. We wanted to be able to, to push it to somebody else for somebody else to maintain so that we can focus on other elements and sort of leverage as much of the community as possible. Um, and we've added other things like uh, being able to put an area sort so that we're you know, using tables to, to bounce over content. And, um, you get it, that a screen reader would be notified if the sort order changes. Uh, views. Um, the views are great. Um, does anyone use views in Drupal? Is, is, is there anything like views in WordPress? What's that mean? It's like, it's, 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 a, it's a query builder. It's a complex query builder. Oh. So it allows you to go off and organize, sort, and manage the display and, and organization of content in, in a really complex and varied way. So it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's between um, fields or content types uh, and, and views. Those are sort of two of the most powerful pieces of Drupal that were brought in in Drupal 7 and that are, are extended in Drupal 8. Um, but there were some problems with how views were done uh, in Drupal 7 in that, that they, they weren't necessarily um, things that were built. The user interface was particularly inaccessible. So um, Canadians with Disability in Ontario, cdwo.org, is a, uh, a Drupal site that, that is, is running and, and, uh, for, for people with disabilities here in Ontario. And one of the challenges that they've they've had <laughs> is, is that, uh, you know, if, if you have a blind user trying to administer the website, they, they can administer almost all of the rest of the website except for view, because view's UI isn't, isn't good for, for blind users. It's too complicated in how it was originally constructed. But we've done a lot of work to clean that up and bring that into core and make sure that because accessibility is an important part of core and in, our, in, in goals, like things are, are blocked from getting, getting implemented in Drupal because of accessibility problems. So there are features that just don't get in because they, there, are, there are accessibility problems. Um, but we're able to, as part of bringing views into core, do a lot of improvements to make that better for everyone. Um, and we've also done things like making sure that, uh, that the tables produced by, um, by views have the semantics in it. So um, header and IDs are already just built into, uh, into it by default for, for, uh, for Drupal uh, table, or tables that are produced by Drupal. Um, there's more context, there's more color contrast, and there's also a common modal dialogue. So again, modals are a complicated, tricky piece of, of accessibility for screen readers. And we're leveraging work that's being done with jQuery UI, 
that's already been extensively tested. And we're, we're being able to, by leveraging this, being able to go off and to, um, to bring this across consistently so that, that this, is, this is how complicated user, inter user interfaces are implemented in Drupal's is through, um, through jQuery UI. Or sorry, the, through the jQuery UI's mobile dialogues. Um, we already talked a little bit about CK Editor. Um, it is uh, you know, definitely uh, one of the bigger uh, open source uh, WYSIWYG editors. And it's really complicated to do WYSIWYG editor properly. CK Editor is getting a lot of uh, direction and support from IBM's accessibility team. Um, and they've, they've, uh, they've also done a lot of work to try and improve the accessibility of their interface um, and make it so that, that it's possible for blind users to be able to leverage their, the WYSIWYG editor as well, um, which is a little bit of an odd thing for a blind user to be able to sort of bold and underline and italics the text using a, a screen reader, but something that, is, um, that they're, um, they're able to do and, and that, that can be useful for providing markup and additional meaning for, for, the, for the editor. Um, but we also wanted to be able to um, make sure that, again, a blind user could administer that as well. So that was a real challenge, is to try and make sure that when we were bringing in the administration of CK Editor into Drupal, that, that a blind user would be able to manage that as, as well as anyone else. Um, and uh, I already mentioned that the alt texts were required but were disableable, um, and that uh, there's the, you know, the ability, again, to, to, to add, um, add headings by default, so that uh, in Drupal, um, initially, the, the, the filters were set up so you couldn't actually add headers. Um, but you actually, for, for, for a lot of contexts, you want to have headers and you want users to be able to use headers if they're producing long, content, long, long pieces of content. Because these are, are navigation points inside that. So if the default filters for Drupal were excluding users from, from adding headers, it was, it was a, a barrier for participation for, for users. Um, can, can I even think about cases where alt text is not a good idea? Decorative images. For which? Decorative images. Decorative images. Uh, there's also... Uh, so under the definition, you're supposed to describe the image, whether it's what it looks like, what its purpose is, if it's a button, or like, so a background image, you're supposed to describe it as a picture of a tree used as a background image. But if there's things like a corner, you've got a, you know, you've got a corner for, it's only for design elements. It's, it's something that... Yeah, It, it is, and there's also got areas where if you have um, multiple images that are the same thing, like you have five parts in a row. Tiles on the map. Tiles on the map, you want to be able to, um, again, have, have it, have it um, yeah, you may not want to have all of those listed. You want to have one that describes what it is. It's going to be <coughs> quadrant 173, quadrant 184. And you, uh, you want to make sure that this, this is actually useful, relevant information that will help a blind user navigate the, the web page. Um, but it is one of these things where, on the, on the one hand, it's so simple, on the other hand, there's a lot of complicated nuances about how you describe it and, and what are you trying to convey and how you guide users along, even something as simple as, as, as alt text. It is, it is definitely quite fascinating. Um, so that's me. I do have more information that I can, uh, I can talk a, a little bit about, actually. Um, in terms of the time, where are we at here? We've got a little bit more time. So, we get another 15 minutes. Um, I just wanted to, to, uh, to actually, are, are there questions at this point? I can talk a bit more about some of the, the next stages, but uh, people have any questions about what are presented so far? The tabbing manager, can you control, like, to me, I don't set cost logs, so the way you control it is the source order of the page. Do you have complete control of the source order of the page? No, you don't. Okay. And, and there's a lot of places where you, you, you'll never, like a lot of complex web interfaces, you're not going to have that. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to go off and choose. So the tabbing manager actually uses tab stops to make sure that tabs are going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. One of the bad things about 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 this is that I'm, I'm not a JavaScript person. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so yeah, it's a very specific question. I'm definitely more of a back end person than a front end person, but uh, I've been doing this you know, in, in, in all kinds of other ways, but I can't answer that particular question. You had a question as well? Yeah, so if you wanted to get involved with helping you guys do core development with this, like, where would you go? Um, I should have had a slide about that. It's a very good question. Um, but there's uh, uh, definitely if you go to, to drupal.org slash about slash accessibility, there's, there's a lot of information there. Um, and there's, there's issue cues on accessibility, lots of issue cues. There's core ways to go up into uh, 
to be involved in the, the core, contribution, core contributions, and module contributions, a lot of these places, there are, there's all kinds of ways to jump into involvement in, um, in Drupal accessibility. Um, but, uh, but certainly, depending on what your interests are and what your background is, uh, there's, there's opportunities for reviewing Drupal 8 or reviewing patches. Even in terms of Drupal 7, there's, there's opportunities to try and, and to, to improve the accessibility of Drupal 7 as well. Um, there are still problems in core, and, and the core, there have been a bunch of, of, uh, of improvements that have happened in Drupal 7 in the last uh, couple months. That were, there's been a, a bunch of, of accessibility improvements that, that, that were brought in. But the way the cycle works right now is that, that in order for any, anything to get into Drupal 7 at this point, it has to get into Drupal 8 first. Once it's in Drupal 8, then it'll be backported to Drupal 7. Um, and possibly at that point, back order to Drupal 6. But at this point, given the, 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 uh, the, um, the fact that Drupal 6 isn't going to be supported for much longer, there's not no one getting all excited about back order to Drupal 6. Um, but there, there's certainly still going to be another probably three to five years where Drupal 7 is going to be supported. And there's a great opportunity there to try and say, well, you know, if, if, you're, if you have a website that's using Drupal 7, like there's a lot of, of uh, government agencies that are using the Web Experience Toolkit developed by Stats um, That's great, and you know, there's a lot of really good stuff in there, but there's also a lot of um, places where there still are problems, even with the Web Experience Toolkit. Uh, one of the things that, that I don't think that anyone has resolved in Drupal, um, all that effect from these error messages just yet, but there, there are, if you have a form and you go up and submit the form, there are, are Trying to go up and make sure that by default those error messages are semantically linked to the fields that they are, are, are that generated those messages, and make sure that that it's it's structured in a way, especially for complex form elements, to see that that is is semantic and, and usable and, and clear and straightforward. It's a complicated issue, and we we have a solution that we've been pushing on for two years, but it's it's again it's tricky to deal with those that core core code base that, that everything else leverages because you know as soon as you, you muck with one element it affects other pieces of it. So um, it has been a, a real challenge to try and, and pull out this functionality and get it get it straightened so that it doesn't break other pieces of the of, uh, of Drupal core. So um, that's that's been a real challenge. But there's, there's lots of great ways to get involved. Um, there's also uh, Drupal events and sprints that are, are happening on a regular basis. I just came back from uh, San Francisco for uh, was, was doing code sprints at Bad Camp, uh, where uh, a lot of us were getting together looking at uh, problems with uh, with Drupal core and Drupal accessibility and finding ways to go off and to contribute stuff back to the community and have this uh, this software be um, you know, built and more, more robust and more accessible and, and uh, work on various different issues with that. So uh, and also, um, with Drupal.org and with the, the, the website itself, there's still improvements that need to be done with with how the content on Drupal. Is set up. Um, but a lot of times, with any open source project, it's about nudging a, an issue. There's a, there's a problem that, you're, that you have, have an interest in. If you can just sort of add your comments at the end of the, of the issue and say, this affects me too, or I tried this patch and it worked, or like these kinds of uh, small little nudges can do a lot to go off and take an open public issue queue and push, push, an, push an issue ahead to see that, that, that there's actually some traction on it. A lot of times that that doesn't happen. People, you know, issues get stalled and they sit there and they sit um, with nobody looking at them and addressing them for, for quite a long time. So, um, the the uh, I wanted to just just to t touch a little bit about uh, this sort of realization that the the web is built on libraries and that you know um, that so much of the time it's it's there's 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 opportunities to fix things upstream, to fix things at the, where they're broken. And, and the whole accessibility industry is really focused on fixing the problems um, at, at a site level. And you can only get so far if you fix it on a per site level. And basically we're spending billions right now around the world trying to go off and fix these problems on a site by site level. And if you thought a little bit bigger, if you thought, uh, thought you know, 10 percent bigger than our current vision of accessibility, the opportunity to go off and fix things would be enormous. Like the uh, there's a, again great progress with the Web Experience Toolkit, but you know Paul Jackson and Nick are probably two of the people in um, in the government of Canada that are really reaching outside of the government of Canada to touch base on various different projects, whether it's Colorbox or whether it's 
the, um, the folks at, at, uh, um, uh, at Bootstrap, or, you know, they're, they're, they're asking questions and pushing things, but two people can only do so much. And you know, there's, there's, a, there's a requirement to try and, and put more energy in and more, and you know, the two people that are doing a whole lot of other stuff as well. But if we can try and get people in our initiatives to think bigger and think up, because so much of the time, the problem is up, right? It may be that the uh, a problem with, with a library that you're using on, with JavaScript, it may be a problem with the, the browsers, it may be a problem with the assistive technology, but there are often in most of these places, if they're an open source program, there's places to go off and to, to attach that problem, um, to say this is an issue and this is something that needs to be addressed. And if you try and find that, if you find an issue, if you search for that, the source of that problem, you can help push towards a solution that will get us further ahead. And that's, that's a really you know, important piece of, uh, of, of web accessibility is trying to actually address these problems once and for all and help move our industry ahead. So that, you know, because it, it, the rate of change is so fast um, that, that if we keep doing it the way we've attempted to do it for the last 20 years, we're never going to catch up. You know, it doesn't matter how many people you bring on board, the technology is moving so quickly that we need to be able to, um, to, to scale up and, 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 and work more robustly and making sure that we isolate the libraries that, that have, uh, and, and Drupal is a library, and jQuery is a library, and, you know, um, Bootstrap is a library. If we, if we put the emphasis on to taking these, these common libraries and improving them, then it's going to be so much more effective to go off and to improve those than any other approach. And you know, if, if, if WordPress, at the core of WordPress, we're able, we're able to go off and fully embrace accessibility, then you know, then there would be like what, 20, 200 million websites, 20 million websites, like tons, like this. You know, twenty percent of the internet would be a lot more accessible if those defaults were baked in to WordPress core. And they're not. They're 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 not just yet. Um, they're getting better thanks to the accessibility team. But there's you know, there's a different kind of structure in terms of how these different um, cultures and programs are being, being generated, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them, but uh, um, um, other slides, as free as in kittens, people think about open source, and just like, okay, it's free, uh, but I like to remind people that it's, it's very much free as in kittens, in that, you know, you have to nurture them, you have to feed them, and you can get software and use software that is free, you don't have to pay for it, but if you don't contribute back to it, there's no guarantee that it will, it will be there next year. And that goes with anything, whether it's WordPress, whether it's, it's you, know, you know, jQuery, whether or not it's, it's this great plugin you found on, on, uh, um, on GitHub, like whatever it is, if you're not contributing back in some way, there's no guarantee it's going to be there when you need it. Um, so trying to go off and, and find ways in our, our procurement processes and in our, in our work structures to be able to find ways to contribute back. Um, because that's, you know, that's something else that uh, uh, Adam was talking about. We need to go up and, and to support <coughs> initiatives like NDDA. Really great initiative. They're doing some really amazing stuff. Uh, just to, to think that there's, you know, I was talking to uh, one of the contributors to, uh, to, to Drupal, uh, Drupal 8 is a blind, a blind user in, um, in Iran. And he, uh, he comes on at all kinds of the hours. He's part of a band and does some of the neat stuff. But occasionally I'll ask him to go off and test stuff for it to see how well it works with, with, uh, with his, his uh, screen reader picking technology. But <coughs> if he wants to read something in Farsi, he has to read it in NDDA. Uh, but it's not as good as JAWS, because if he's going to write read English text, he'll, he'll use it in JAWS, because JAWS is a more powerful application. But you know, why is that? It's because well, JAWS has gotten millions and billions, of, if not billions of dollars worth of public funding to go off and to finance this application that has been the default you know, application out there. And, you know, we need to really look at these three <coughs> options that are, are being funded by people um, who are, are doing some really you know, amazing, innovative stuff that allow for, for tools like uh, math L, uh, MathML and, and uh, uh, Chem, uh, Chem, uh, I'm sorry, Chem, ChemLM, no, MathLM and ChemLM, the, uh, the tools that, uh, uh, um, that Adam was talking about sort of being built into <coughs> the NBA. You know, it's, it's, it's really useful to go and support these initiatives so that it's not just, you know, don't, you know Latin-based languages that have an opportunity to go off and to be effectively represented through a streaming technology. Um, so, yeah, we need one. Um, I think there's also this huge opportunity to try and think about um, accessibility and open source, and, and because there's there's a lot of opportunities for people with disabilities to get involved and to start getting engaged in, in 
changing the technology, it's making it better for them. Um, it's it's something where for, for physical accessibility, we don't expect people who have these wheelchairs to go off and to re, rebuild the doors, make the doors bigger, and, and be able to install ramps themselves. But a lot of places with web accessibility, there's a real opportunity for people with disabilities to go off and to improve their own world, their own virtual world can be improved by getting involved in leveraging and testing these tools and finding out ways to, to make them better for everyone, to be able to sort of identify the problems and push push the push for solutions in, in, in these various different communities. So uh, that's why I think open source is necessary. The rate of changing that is going quickly. Regular testing, that's a huge other piece of this. Um, it, I'm sort of, you know, there's an element where so many agencies think that they're big enough to address these issues, and that they've got enough staff on board to go up and take, take on web accessibility, but it's a really vast issue, and, and there, I don't know of a government agency or any institution um, in the world that's big enough to go up and take this on with any decent justice, and this really does require uh, much bigger, broader thinking about how to do things. Um, and, uh, and that's basically my thoughts on open source accessibility. And once again, at the end of my slides, so, so, any other questions? I guess I just yeah. want to jump in with a comment. Um, good, good. I know earlier in my presentation we were having some fun about like Drupal versus WordPress, but I think, in all honesty, um, you have to look at your platform of choice based on the project, based on your audience, right? So, Drupal does things better than WordPress, and vice versa. It really comes down to uh, what your project requires and whatnot, and then finding kind of what works, and uh, to, to, to see that uh, Drupal has uh, gone the extra mile to, to be accessible is definitely uh, very encouraging uh, to see. Um, also, I think, uh, just, to, just to jump back and just a quick note on, on, on what you mentioned about alt tags, um, I think the, the, the idea of the alt tags is really to improve like interpretation, right? And so, um, when you're talking about what's your best standard or the best way of going about it, you really have to think about how you're going to paint that picture for somebody who can't necessarily see the image. Right. And so adding or excluding alt tags should only really be determined based on how uh, you want somebody to be, be able to interpret the page. So if you add in too many alt tags, you may be skewing that interpretation with overloading them with too much info. Uh, yep. Vice versa, if you have too little, you're not giving them enough to be able to interpret that. So I think in terms of best standards and using alt tags, you really want to think about interpretation first versus the technical end or, oh, I should you know, do this or do that. If you think about, okay, how can I paint this picture for somebody who can't see, the uh, alt tag best practices comes kind of very fluid and very natural. And you think about it from that standpoint. So that's just making sense. The, the, the trouble is, is that that's, uh, people producing content, the people who think about alt tags first and think about it in the way that you described is maybe one fraction of 1% of people that right. are creating content. And the vast majority of, of people who are who should be putting in alt text are putting in alt text. So how do you change that pattern? How do you make that, how do you change the authoring experience so that people start thinking about it more? And this is definitely a, uh, a more intrusive means to try and do that, but uh, you know, hopefully it's something that, that gets gets attention, gets people thinking about it, and gets, gets us thinking about it. <laughs> so, um, we, we had a little bit of time to prepare, 10 minutes, we can, we can like, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, you know, 12, minutes. 12 minutes, okay, okay, <laughs> I'm not sure we'll necessarily need that, but, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely an element of trying to choose the right tool, and it is a really difficult challenge to get to know what is the right tool in the right place, and they keep changing, right, you know, WordPress keeps getting better, so does Drupal, and there's an element where, like, depending on what you're looking for, like, there was a point where, where, Drupal is becoming more of an enterprise product and is being focused more for enterprise level projects. Now that that's, you've now got Symphony and Core, and that there, there's, a, there's an element where it's, it's, a, it's a more robust, more, but that's, you know, for some, so a, lot of, uh, a lot of clients, you, you want something that's simple, easy to maintain, you want to be able to get in and hack the PHP and, and do stuff that's more fluid, and, and there's places where you know, that's, that's not something, something that's harder for Drupal to deal with in the future. So yeah, absolutely. Thinking about it on a case-by-case you know, -case basis is is a, uh, is a real challenge. And we've, as a as a business, I've decided not to go off and to to have multiple CMSs that we're supporting. And, and it's just been even trying to go off and to deal with 
with just Drupal, there's so much happening just in this one CMS community that I can't imagine how large my team would be in order to do decent justice on three or four different CMSs. Sure. Yes. I think that that's why both most businesses pick a favorite. Pick a favorite. Yeah. I think I think between the WordPress and Drupal communities, we should just all start Fashion Juma. <laughs> never come to these events anyway. Exactly, that's why. <laughs> It'd be an easy, easy stab. <laughs> I think we can go for a coffee break. There's enough this year. What's that? We have a wonderful keynote that's coming up. And so I want everyone to stay for the keynote. Most importantly, because there's going to be some, some great Star Wars references that I think will, will inspire us all looking ahead to go off into uh, to think about the future of this industry. Um, and also there's a treat after that. <laughs> so if you stay through the entire keynote, there's a treat that you, you want to stay for because it will be worth it. Um, and then, I'm saying that because I'm standing right here. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, after the treat, um, there's a bunch of us will be going to the Air on the Loon afterwards. So uh, if you want to continue on this discussion and discuss accessibility over beer uh, and food, uh, we're going to be heading to the Glebe at Bank and Fifth uh, shortly. As soon as we can clean up and lock up here, we're all going to be, or everyone is going to be heading down there. We've already checked that there's going to be room for about 20, 20 or so people there. So, um, and it's an accessible facility as far as I know. Um, so it should be a great, great spot. And hopefully as many people as possible can, can come out tonight to that. And if you eat another lunch, you'll get a second piece of the tree. That's right. So you need to, there's a whole other lunch here that I expect everyone to try and help, help themselves to. Um, so, 10 minutes? Yeah, so 10 minutes for coffee and then we'll begin Derek's talk.